Good morning, friends. Let's get straight back to Psalm 119. Remember, Jesus taught us that it's through his word that God brings us to himself and equips us to serve him. Again, you might like to pause me and read Psalm 119, verses 17 through to 32, but don't worry if not. Perhaps you could read that afterwards. I'm going to do something different today and just pick three of the verses in these two paragraphs and mull over them with you. There are broader themes and patterns in these paragraphs, and it's good to explore those. But essentially, this psalm is 176 individual truths about the word of truth, the scriptures. And it's perfectly proper to consider them one by one. And there's no particular connection between these three. First, then, verse 18. Open my eyes, that I may see wonderful things in your law. This is one of my favourite prayers when I read the Bible every morning. Notice what it says. The law of God has wonderful things in it. That's objectively true. It's the word of the wonderful counsellor. Of course his words are wonderful. And that's true whether or not I see them. So will I see them as they really are? Will I behold the wonderful God who speaks these wonderful words? That's the question. Or will I read a Bible passage and not engage with it at all, my eyes passing over the words while my mind is distracted by some other concern. Ask me even two minutes later on a day like that and I couldn't tell you what I'd read. Or will I read it and understand it and tick it off on my Bible reading app, but not actually be moved by it to faith or joy or obedience or worship or love or repentance, whatever is appropriate as I read that particular scripture, well, I just read it like a Pharisee, storing it up coldly inside. There are so many ways to miss the wonderful things in God's word, even while we're reading it. You see, Bible reading is a supernatural activity, and we should always ask the author of the scriptures to open our eyes to see the wonderful things he has prepared for our nourishment today. Don't miss them. Second, verses, verse 25 I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. There's deep realism in this psalm. The life of faith is not escapism. I am laid low in the dust, he cries. More literally, in the older translation, my soul cleaveth unto the dust. That's cleave in the sense of join together inseparably. It's the same word, again, from the older version, as we find in Genesis 2, 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The psalmist isn't just lying in the dust from which he might pick himself up and brush himself off easily. He's immersed in it. He's yoked to it. He can't escape from it. Like him, we too are children of Adam. Dust you are, and to dust you will return. And the virus reminds us of that. We're mortal. Death and decay are catching up with us from the very moment we're born. And what is our response? On the third day, he rose again. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. The psalmist points in the same direction. He doesn't despair, and neither should we. Preserve my life, he cries, according to your word. Preserve here isn't quite strong enough. It's a plea for renewal, not mere preservation. Quicken in the old translation. We might pray, revive me according to your word. Give me life that transcends this clinging dust, a life eternal promised in your word. It anticipates Paul's cry and remedy from Romans 7. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. Christ's empty tomb has already guaranteed the renewal of all who trust in him and defeated death and all its precursors, including coronavirus. Third, and this is one of my favourite verses from the whole psalm, verse 32. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. If we're not self-isolating, we're all being encouraged to take some exercise outdoors every day. Maybe all of this will actually make some of us fitter. One of our teenagers in the church family in the crossover video meeting we had on Sunday night 
told me he had run 22 kilometres that day and could have gone further, oh, to be 15 again. There's something magnificent in watching an athlete at the peak of their powers. And that's the picture in this verse. This is not the middle-aged and slightly overweight man wheezing his way along the canal path. Perhaps that's a bit personal. The psalmist pictures his heart, his spirit, his soul, his inward man, whatever the state of his outward body, running like the wind, utterly free, running like the youthful athlete with no constraint, and he's running in the path of the Lord's commands. He's full of energy, passion, single-minded and joyful devotion to the Lord's word. So how do we have that attitude to the scriptures as we open them each day? Well, listen again to the logic of the verse. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. We love the word of God because the gospel of God has liberated us from the curse of God from sin and death and hell, from futility and self and stuff. Do you remember the scene in Forrest Gump where he breaks free of the shackles and suddenly discovers that he can run? That's the picture here. We're free. No more guilt. No more shame. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, and we've been set free so that we might run in the path of his commands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we open the scriptures each day, open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law. As we find ourselves laid low in the dust, revive us according to your word. And as we face this new day as those set free by Jesus Christ, grant that we would run with perseverance and joy in the path of your commands. In his name we pray. Amen.